Hi everyone, since there are some non-Hebrew speaking guests, then uh, I'm going to speak in English, if you don't mind. Raise my voice. Use the mic. Okay. Um, okay, so, hi, my name is uh, Yair. I'm a team leader at Leadspace, and I'm going to talk today about Spark. Uh, raise your hand if you think you're going to hear about big data. Okay, so <coughs> that's an unfortunate naming choice uh, with Spark. This is Spark Java, not Apache Spark. Um, Spark Java is a framework for serving web applications. And I've been with Leadspace about six years now. I was part of the team that transitioned Leadspace from a monolith to microservices. And that's something that's been done uh, before. I think what's interesting in our case is that we ended up using Spark for a lot of our uh, services. Okay. So first of all, let's talk about what Spark is, because I'm sure some of you uh, don't know. Spark is a framework for serving web applications. Those web applications can be uh, static resources or they can be REST requests. And the idea behind Spark is basically to do, to provide a minimal framework for serving web apps. What is, what do I mean by minimal? I mean that basically what you need in order to serve a request, an HTTP request is you need to map a verb and route, verb as in get, post, put, and so on, a route, and then have some sort of handler handle the business logic. That's basically it. Besides that, you need to provide some sort of context as far as the request and response enable your business logic to uh, address the request. Okay, so Spark is... I mean, it's not that well known, but it is an actively maintained project. It has about 6,000 stars on GitHub, which is roughly more or less, uh, let's say, what Drop Wizard has. I think that Spring Boot has around 17,000. So it's something that is actively maintained. And what can you do with it? So let's start with the Hello World scenario. Not really interesting, but it is interesting in the context of how fast we can go from zero to actually working on the business logic and skip the part where we deal with all the uh, web serving. So what I did was basically build a hello world and I wanted to see how quickly I could do it and I went from zero code to a web service that is a working web service in 35 seconds. Now we don't have time for live coding today but I did record <laughs> quickly um, an example of how it works. Second. Okay, so basically we started with a class. I'm creating a main function here. You can see this is the format in which Spark maps endpoints. You have a get request with hello. There's a lambda with a request and response and it returns a string in this case, world. Started it up, started a terminal and you can see that I run a curl and I get a response, by the way, Port 4567 is the default port if you don't specify anything else. So you saw this took about 35 seconds, pretty quick. Um, Spark really leverages Java 8 lambdas in the sense that it, it's a very terse syntax. It's very short. You have your request response, and you, then you can do whatever you want with it. Now, apart from that, the extra work in setting up Spark is not really much. Uh, this is the, in the Maven palm file. Basically, what's interesting here is that you need one dependency that pulls in everything that you need. And it's pretty slim. The, it, the fat jar that's created is not really very big. Um, then there's the Maven source plugin for Java 8. But that's about all you need to do to set up the project. Okay, a little under the hood of uh, Spark. So Spark is a way to easily develop web applications, but you do need some sort of server under the hood. And the default server that comes with Spark is Jetty. You can use others. I haven't seen a, a real working example where you would want to use others, but basically it's under the hood, it's embedded Jetty. So anything you want to do that you would want to do with 
uh, Jetty, you can do with Spark. Apart from that, as far as configurations, uh, there are like the standard stuff you want to control, like ports and threads and timeouts and stuff like that. Very easy to do. Just set it up in the main just before uh, mapping the endpoints, and you're good to go. So the main properties, the main configurations are very easily accessible. But also for advanced use cases, if you have, I don't know, a Jetty container that has all kinds of endpoints and really edge cases, you can also do that. You can supply Spark with a factory, and Spark will invoke that factory to get your server and not the default one. Okay, um, how do we use the context that we're given by Spark? So we are given a request and response, and the example that you see here is slightly uh, more complex, but not much. This time we take a parameter from the URL, and we also set the mime type because we want to return a JSON response. We use the parameter, and now the idea in Spark is that you, in your business logic, return an object, and then you can do whatever you want with an object, but you still have to serialize it into a string because, after all, the, the response is returned as a string. And that's where you can see the uh, JSON, which, in this case, I used for serializing a map object. This is an immutable map, and I turn it into a string. Um, but if you want to serve a CSV, if you want to create a CSV endpoint, just use, I don't know, Apache CSV or any other CSV serializer, and you can take that map and create a CSV or a map of a map. Now, this is, the, this is basically what you get when you run the code that I just showed. So you can see that you do get the MIME type, and that object, that map, just you know, magically uh, turns into JSON. OK, a little about how we use it at LeadSpace. So just to give you a frame of reference of what is LeadSpace, we're a medium-sized startup. That means you know, we're not doing a proof of concept. We have customers, paying customers, and so on. But then on the other hand, we're not Netflix or Google or Tabula. You know, we're not in that scale. So various, we were really concerned that various frameworks uh, that we chose would really slow us down as far as the upfront work that's required to set it up. And that's when we started looking at different alternatives. Originally. We started out with a proof of concept, which was just a stack of Java with a MySQL database behind it. And pretty quickly, you know, we started running into problems. The code base was too big. The build time was too long. Uh, any change would start breaking. And this is way back. This is, you know, 2012. We understood we needed to start splitting up our code base, splitting up our services. And this is even before the word microservices was, you know, well known. And so what we started doing, we tried all kinds of, we made a lot of you know, detours until we reached uh, the place we are in today. We tried adapting Tomcat. We did services that were WAR files, which is not really great because the Tomcat is still the one who is <coughs> serving the WAR file. It's not an embedded uh, setup. And then if you have you know, Tomcat crashing or something like that, it takes out a lot of services in one step. And uh, it's a headache as far as provisioning, which we dealt with Ansible and other things. But we realized that we needed to go to transition into a paradigm of an embedded server. And that's when we started looking at different alternatives to that. So what did we look at? We looked at Spring Boot and Drop Wizard. Basically, those were the two uh, alternatives that we considered. And I know... Uh, there's going to be a talk about Spring Boot later, so I'm... Uh, uh, what we found out between the three is that Spark, and this is something that we really liked about Spark, was the least opinionated of the three. Meaning, basically, what you saw here is all that's required. Anything else is optional. You want to use JSON, use JSON. You want to use Jackson, fine. Um, pretty much anything goes. It just provides that layer of mapping the endpoint to the logic. And Spring Boot and Drop Wizard, Drop Wizard is basically you know, a collection of um, standards, I would say, of different libraries that work well together. Spring Boot is certainly pretty opinionated as far as the things it pulls with it, Spring NVC and so on. And we wanted 
you know, to not be tied to a specific um, set of technologies at that point when we made the decision. And that was the main reason that we went with uh, Spark. Plus, it was pretty fast to, to go. We started with a proof of concept, and we very quickly went from the proof of concept to something that was production grade. And we were very happy about that. So basically, Spark helped us with this problem, which is usually what happens when you're dealing with microservices. Setting them up front is a really, really, really big headache. OK. How do we use Okay. How do we use Spark in LeadSpace? What are the interesting use cases? So the classic use cases are for serving data. We have whatever, configuration data, um, machine learning models that we might want to serve, a data store with a thin wrapper for a thin rest wrapper for serving. It is uh, something that is a classic use case for uh, Spark. Business logic, obviously, if you have some stateless calls that you want to serve rapidly, that's also a good use case. And orchestrators, you have these services that, you know, uh, go off and call other ones and you need to, you know, you have this whole tree sometimes of actions that you want to perform and you need this service to manage all the rest. Also, a use case that we found is very effective using Spark. And while I showed REST endpoints, it's not necessarily limited to that. I mean, we have services that use queues, Kafka, or MQ, or those types of uh, things. Works well in that case, too. When would you not want to use Spark? So the cases where, at LeadSpace, we do not want to use Spark is, for instance, web serving. Web serving tends to have you know, that layer of security and cookies and a lot of things that Spark, just being so thin, does not provide. And in that case, usually we will go with, let's say, Node and Express or something like that, something also that the front end engineers are more comfortable working with. <clears throat> and then there's the case of services that have high concurrency, asynchronous IO, stuff like that. You'll probably want to be, use, be using, I don't know, Akka or Vertex or something like that. That's the more appropriate, usually, uh, more appropriate uh, framework for that. As far as testability, how do we, you know, it's, it's very nice to write a service, but if it's not dependable, then uh, you have a problem. What we do, as far as, unit as far as unit testing, we spin up an instance in the unit test, we test the endpoints, we mock the databases, and then we turn it off. So that's something that is also covered. And finally, as far as, I, I covered the really basic use cases, but there are also other interesting aspects to Spark that can also be done. And for instance, dependency injection, Spark, Spark works well with uh, DI frameworks such as Spring or Juice. You can work with either of them. You, in the main, you just you know, load your configuration and uh, go ahead. Web serving. I said that like the complicated web server is something that <coughs> you wouldn't necessarily want, but there are cases where you need to, you know, get an idea of how your service is doing, you know, um, get information about its health and so on. You want to access directly the information there. And then it's very convenient that you can serve static files with, you know, maybe some information about the health of the server or something like that, and write maybe a very thin UI layer um, that pretty much you don't have to be a front-end engineer to do, and you can do that. And finally, uh, I know a lot of, there's a lot of buzz about Kotlin, and the creators of Spark are also uh, very interested in Kotlin, and they have a parallel project where they're developing Spark with Kotlin. So that's also something that's coming, and something that's not on the slide that I actually saw today. The next uh, version, which is coming up, I think, in a month or so, is, uh, is going to support Java 9. So as I said, it's something that's being actively developed, and. Um, it's an interesting project. And that's it. If, do we have time for questions or one minute? One question. Yeah. Yes. Well, the limitation is that Spark is, uh, it's not, asynchronous I.O. It's based on Jetty. 
And just like you, when you would, you know, when you're selecting, if you want something that works with a lot of HTTP connections or a lot of IO and, you know, the, in that case, having a thread that's basically waiting for input is um, not the classic use case. If you need something that is very high performance, just like if you were, you know, considering using either Jetty or, uh, like I said, Akka or Vertex or those, the, the ones based on Netty, then in that case, you might want to go with something that's based on Netty and not, not Jetty. That's, that's the... Uh, hmm? The, the basic Spark use case is that it comes bundled with Jetty. You can, I mean, it's, it's, it's extra overhead to implement some other server. And as I said, I haven't seen examples, um, certainly not in lead space, that we uh, use some other server. So you know, it's a matter of trade-offs. I think that if you would try to, if you tried something that's very high concurrency with Spark, you might have a lot of overhead doing that. So that's the logic. Okay. Thanks.